We refer to this as an OEIP, Oklahoma Education and Industry Partnerships. Our purpose with these OEIPs is to bring technology and industry into a presentation where you, the instructors or part of the educational system, can see what emerging technologies are out there, what potential occupations might be there for your students that you are training. And in, in essence, it's really what the career tech system is trying to do. We're trying to provide opportunities for our educators to see what industry is doing so they can better prepare the students that they have in their classroom to meet the needs of that. And you know, one of the things that we see a lot is the fact that we have employers needing people that aren't, there's no pull out there for them to draw from. We want to do our best to make sure they have that pull to draw those potential employees from. And I'm very excited. We've got a class here from Tulsa Tech, it looks like. Thank you for being here. We're glad the students are here being represented. So uh, I'm not going to go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves. You'll meet other people as you do that, and so you can do that then. But I'm not the one that's going to be running this meeting. Tech Labs is, and so we're just going to be here like you to observe and learn and grow from this experience. And so today I'm going to introduce you to a couple, uh, a few concepts, and, and please, uh, please stop, uh, stop us, ask questions. We want to make this an interactive session. Uh, we have some of our subject matter experts uh, here today, and I'll introduce these folks as we move through the session. Um, just as a brief introduction, we have a Stratasys. Uh, we'll be presenting. Mike Hayden is here with us today. Uh, Mike's a veteran with additive manufacturing. Uh, are any of you familiar with the term additive manufacturing? Yep. So additive manufacturing is a term that we use today. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing is, is there. There's a lot of prototyping that, that might happen. And that's only a small segment of what folks do in additive manufacturing or with additive manufacturing technologies. And we're going to talk about the other side of the technologies, what can be done in industry and also what can be done in education, what the students should be learning, what industry expects those students to have, and we'll talk about some credentialing that's brand new, focused on additive manufacturing that you could deliver to your students and also deliver to your professional engineers who are using additive manufacturing throughout the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we work uh, here in education in Oklahoma with additive manufacturing and 3D printing with Stratasys. We also provide 3D printing systems to your industry partners where you're sending students. And so we put 3D printers in to those facilities as well. And so that's really exciting. So um, we're gonna have Mike come up and, and give us a, um, a run through in a moment of, of, um, of Stratasys and the new technologies that they've developed and released uh, here recently. And so that's, that's real exciting. Uh, here, this is uh, Mike Hickman. He's a colleague and um, He's we'll be demonstrating the FANUC Cobot. It's called a CRX collaborative robot, right? So you can see that the robot's performing some, some basic tasks. It's picking, it's performing a pick and place task. It's basically picking something up and moving it based on the program that was set and designed. Uh, Mike can also grab the robot and move it around himself um, uh, with his hands. And so this is a, a relatively new idea in the terms of uh, in the world of automation. So he's grabbing the robot, he has the teach pendant, he's selecting the button, and he's able to move the robot <clears throat> around and select a point there, and then move the robot to another point, and then uh, click a button, essentially, and the robot will remember that program, okay? Uh, traditionally, in, in robotics and automation, he would not be anywhere close to this robot right now. Typically, you would have guarding. A fence, essentially, is a guarding uh, all the way around the robot, uh, conveyors running through it, or you would have light curtains and sensors that if you move close to the robot, uh, it would shut down or stop or pause. And so you wouldn't be able to really interface with that robot at all. And so you would typically see the traditional robots in a manufacturing line in a, in a facility this large. It could be assembling an aircraft could be assembling components of an aircraft system, could be assembling electric vehicle systems. And so uh, this, this robot with a cobot can be now put into place wherever 
you want it to be. So you could put it in your office, for example. Uh, the reason you can do that is because the robot has sensors that if it touches you, it'll automatically stop and it won't hurt you, it won't run into you. And, uh, and so that's a safety feature. Uh, industrial robot uh, now can be, can be used in a, in a co collaborative mode. And so that's what this system does. Uh, that's FANUC. Uh, just as a, as a reference, FANUC is the number one robot manufacturer in the world. Um, they uh, produce more robots and have more robots installed uh, compared to any other robot system in the world. And so uh, our, our goal uh, with working with FANUC and education Again, is to certify students to go work in industry. And we have several credentials uh, surrounding the robotic system. Uh, the first one is material handling credential. That's where we saw the pick and place where he's moving the dice around. And there's a second, and so there's a knowledge credential, a hands-on credential. So we, in career tech, you want to make sure they have the hands-on parts. We have the credential for that. And then the second credential is And so Vision is essentially a camera system. And if we had a camera system mounted on the robot, it would see, can I have a dice? It would see the, the dice, um, the, the, the numbers, it would see the dots, if you will, and it would, you would program it to recognize that we wouldn't have all sixes, for example. So it would pick it up and it would place all sixes in, 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 the, in the spot here. Now, transferring that to industry, um, a great example of that is, is uh, if you're working the manufacturing line with vision and uh, I'll use a, a good example from here in Tulsa. If you're making biscuits or you're making um, uh, pies, for example, and you're, and you're baking those, um, th those, uh, that product and, and one happens to, to be burnt or it's a darker color than the rest, the robot vision system will see that biscuit and it could pick it up and throw it away or discard it. And so as it's going down the line, you don't have to have someone there picking those biscuits off of the off of the conveyor and, and moving those, the robot system will see that and it'll automatically do that for you. Okay, that's just one example of a robotic vision system and those systems are used um, all over. Um, so, so automation's being introduced into industry um, to really uh, address efficiencies. Uh, it's not really designed to take anyone's job. You know, have, uh, have any of you heard that idea? Yeah, okay. So robots are not designed to take anyone's job. Robots are typically put into to manufacturing uh, uh, to help efficiencies, okay? So for example, just the example I gave, picking the biscuits off the conveyor, who want, how, many, how many of you want to have that job, right? And so at some point, that was someone's uh, role there, but now the robot system can do that and you can eliminate that responsibility. Um, and, so, and so robots are, are there for, for those tasks. Robots are there for hazardous tasks. Uh, maybe you're working with uh, combustible material and the robot could work in that environment instead of having a person be there. So a lot of reasons for that. Robots uh, really aren't designed to take, take anyone's uh, job. Um, so, so this is a cobot. We're moving down the line. Of course, Lincoln Electric. These systems have been around a while. Uh, uh, the virtual welding system. Uh, which, is, which is great, it's very engaging. Uh, we can do a demo of that, but um, this system allows you to do several different types of uh, welding positions. And uh, again, this is not to take your time in the booth for, for the folks in education, uh, those of you working with industry. Uh, you can create a custom weld process within the software, have your industry folks come in and perform that, that, uh, that specific weld process before they get into the, to the booth. And so typically if you have them in the booth and they're learning, they're learning a, a welding procedure, you may have 10 folks there and half the folks may be learning that, that process incorrectly, right? And they come to you and say, well, look, here's my weld. You say, well, you, you were too close or you weren't positioned properly. And then they have to go back and do that. This system, we can identify their, their abilities and what they need help with up front. And we give them some clues on how to weld properly, for example. We have a little arrow inside there that tells them that they're they're too close, it'll turn red, or it'll turn red if they're too far, and it'll be green right when they're in the sweet spot. And so we'll give them some great clues that they can begin to practice welding processes, and we can tighten those tolerances up. And so maybe just something as simple as position. I worked with some, some pipeline welders uh, uh, one time. These are veteran pipeline folks. And of course they knew what they were doing. And so I was a little worried that I wasn't going to be able to find anything that they had a challenge with. And so I just told them, to go for it and, and figure it out. And so we, we, uh, they, they had a couple runs with the, with the virtual welding system. 
And we found that they, that they weren't bad, but they might use some, some, some help or some, needed some clues on, on some of the, the, the processes, and, and it was positioning. So we, uh, it was their body position, something simple as that. The, the well was great, but we tightened the tolerances up really, really tight, and we gave them a clue, and they were actually able to improve that. And they recognized That's welding from Lincoln Electric from VR. Creoform, um, 3D scanning. Okay, have, have you all heard of 3D scanning? Uh, you know what the applications are for 3D scanning. So taking a, a physical object, uh, maybe that doesn't have a, um, uh, a, a digital file, reverse engineering is what you've, what you've heard uh, of maybe uh, for, for 3D scanning. A lot of folks in industry are using 3D scanning for quality control. So think machining. So if you're working in the aerospace, the tolerances are essentially zero. It has to be a perfect part. And the way that they were measuring that before could be with, by, your, by hand, which is not very accurate. And they could use another device that has a, pro, a touch probe on it. There's room for error because the human is involved, unfortunately. Um, well, with uh, 3D scanning, we can, we can scan using a laser system and it gets uh, the measurements down to a, to a very small, uh, a small amount. We'll, we'll talk about that. Creoform, or SME from Industries here. He works here in, in Tulsa with all of your industry partners with 3D scanning. And so he, we'll have, have a discussion about that uh, shortly. Uh, this system here is, uh, has been great. This is our electric vehicle and hybrid vehicle system. Uh, we teach technicians to, to work with electric vehicles and hybrid systems. Uh, safely. A hybrid system has very high voltage and it's essentially something that is very difficult. It's not impossible. It's very difficult for folks to, to train on because it's dangerous. And so we can simulate this here. We sim simulate um, five different drivetrains, different setups for electric vehicles, for hybrid vehicles. And so uh, we're going to, to spend some time uh, doing some hands-on. We can have you come over and, and demonstrate this as well. And then the system over here uh, supports all of the learning processes as students move into learning about how motors uh, are, are designed and how the batteries get charged, right? So if you're driving an electric vehicle, it charges itself and, and we'll, the motors will do that. And so the system is the foundation uh, for uh, folks to learn how the electric vehicle functions, how the motors work, what types of motors are there, all the technology surrounding electric vehicles. Electric vehicle, all right, cool. Or hybrid, hybrid vehicles, yeah, good. Yeah, nice. So that's, that's there, um, um, and so we're, we're uh, happy to work with folks here in Oklahoma um, uh, with that system as well, and so, uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, at this time, um, are there any questions? Again, we wanna make sure that you're, this is not just us uh, talking, I was in a, a <laughs> A multi-day event last week where they were just talking at me. And so I want you to talk back to me and, and have a conversation. So if there are any, any questions about any of the technologies before we move forward, I, I expect that we're going to have a couple of our subject matter experts present the technologies regarding uh, additive manufacturing and 3D scanning. And then at the end, we're going to spend some time, certainly for the students, um, before you leave, regardless of where we're at in the presentation, if you don't, uh, I would invite you to go ahead and, and, and slide over before you leave to, to put your hands on some robots or put, uh, put the helmet on uh, and, and perform some welding. Uh, so you do that before you leave, regardless of where we are, please. Caden Stratus, thank you. Jamie, thank you, buddy. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody, my name is Mike, I'm from Dallas. I've been in the business for almost 15 years. Um, I used to manage industrial for Stratasys for a while, and uh, I moved into education a few years ago, which I thoroughly enjoy. So how many educators do we have in the room? Right, how many students? Great, I would like to talk to all of you later after, after uh, and show you some things. Uh, how many admin people? Couple, three, right? How many people from industry? Right on, right on. How many people use any type of 3D printer in the room? Great, great. What kind? Fantastic. Which, which, which uh, FDM, Polyjet? FDM. Okay. Right on. How about everybody else? I saw one back here. 
Who else uses 3D printers? Okay, what kind? Enders. Enders? Dremels, Dremels right on. Forge. And Mark Forge, right on. All FDM type of printers. So there's about seven different additive technologies now in the world, right? There is, uh, well, a little backstory. I said it was 30 years ago that it was invented, right? Uh, how many people have been involved in science fairs in their life? Not too many, that's surprising, okay. Well, the idea actually grew out of a science fair. So a guy named Scott Crump up in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, who's an engineer, he, his daughter was working on her science fair project, and they decided to see if they could extrude ABS plastic through a hot glue gun and use a CNC gantry to, instead of subtractively take away, which is what G-code is always before traditionally, to actually build up something. And they printed, the very first 3D print ever made was of a frog. It was a green frog. And that's how Scott Crump started in the business. Since then, it has, uh, it almost expanded simultaneously with a, with a technology called stereolithography, which is a very big hard word to say. It was almost 30 years ago. Scott's daughter is about 38 years old now. So she's a little bit younger than me, but uh, simultaneously, a guy named Chuck Hall out in Valencia, California, who was not an engineer, but he was a chemical scientist, was playing with some photochemical polymers and some acrylics, and he went home for the weekend to go surf in California, and he left a vat of chemicals in his window, and when he came back on Monday, it had turned solid. The UV light from the sun turn this liquid into a solid. And that is the basis of stereolithography, which developed into a laser-based vat of photopolymer that they would hit with a laser, and everywhere the UV laser hits it, it instantaneously turns solid. So by using G-code in that manner, they were able to make what is, be, became the 3D Systems brand, and also many other brands now because the patents have expired. Uh, right now, Stratasys carries five different technologies. We have many of the kinds of technologies I just talked about, the VAT and photopolymerization. We use it in two or three different types of our processes. One is the Origin One, which is a brand new printer that we have. I'll talk a little bit about that today. The other one is our classic uh, technology out of Israel called Objet, and it's called Polyjet technology. And for our design teacher in the back, this is the full color, fully capable, it's basically a Star Trek replicator. You can scan any object you want and remake it from a piece of fruit to a fuselage housing for an airplane. Um, it, is a, it is a unique technology and it has a great visual appeal where FDM is a tough technology where you use high impact thermoplastics to actually make real parts that you can use and end use parts for production, right, is what it's about. Uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today hopefully is something that's gonna be a benefit to everybody in the room. Um, I want to talk to you guys about what Stratasys is doing to partner with industry and education to develop a certification program for all of your students and all of your educators that will allow them to get third-party accreditation for using developing materials, the production and use of the 3D printers, and also um, getting them certified to take digital badges and certific certification credit forward to their next job that tells an employer, hey, you have 3D printers that you use in your, in, at your production facilities, I'm certified to use those 3D printers. Uh, this is not something that Stratasys has ever been able to do before. With third party, we've run our own accreditation program for years, but that is not what we need in order to get this gentleman the grants that he needs. Because a lot of our Pell grants and a lot of our federal grants and a lot of our state grants are now tied to Certification credit for courses and funding is following that path, and that's why we're doing this. So I've got a slide presentation that I'll start, and I'll hopefully please stop me if you have questions on either the technology or where we're headed with this, or if you have any in particular questions. I do not want to make this a, I tell you all stuff and you guys don't talk to me. I want to hear about your experience with stuff or students. If you have got questions, y'all let me know, okay, please. So our goal here is to build the skills gap by Im implementing 3D printing in inside of your curriculum. So the guy I talked about, Scott Crump, that's him. That's him when he was young. That was 30 some years ago in his garage in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, where he actually built the first 3D printer. 
We've got a drawing of what he first thought of when he made it. And that is the drawing that was first rendered of the very first 3D printer. An FDM, bring a stringer line of filament into the printer, heat it up, and then draw a shape with it, is the whole design. And this is what came out of it. That was the very first Stratasys 3D printer ever made. It doesn't look too different from the ones we see today on the market. This was 30 years ago. You said you had a F120? Yes. Okay, so you've got our smallest FDM printer. Uh, do you remember what you paid for it by any chance? 25? All in, I'm sure, with the wash station and everything else, about that much. It, it, its retail price was supposed to be 19000 right? $999. Uh, and you get the tax title license and out the door. This one actually came on the market at two hundred and eighty thousand dollars, nineteen ninety one. So as we know, I know that things are expensive in the VR space right now with your headset, but all technology reduces in price over time. Amazon for five hundred bucks. So as I said earlier, we've got five different types of technologies, and they all really range from everything that deals with production from aircraft to medical to artistic design to uh, lost wax casting, urethane casting. Uh, we can even dive into the medical uh, space now. Uh, our Polyjet technology has become so advanced that we can print air gaps and liquid gaps with inside of uh, 4D CAT scan images of the human body. We are currently running medical programs at almost all the major medical universities where we take that 4D MRI scan of your body, if you've got cancer in your liver or if you've got scoliosis in your spine, and they take those scans and they turn them into digital models that the surgeons will actually practice the surgery on or they'll prepare how they're gonna realign that spine to make it straight. They're actually using it to make those bodies. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, I think that within the next 20 years, we will be culturing stem cells and we will be printing replacement organs for people directly from their own stem cells. Uh, we have already been able to print uh, organic kidneys that are non-profused from stem cells already. The, the real big uh, key to that matrix is figuring out how to profuse these organs that are actually printed with an FDM process. I couldn't hear the question. Yes, they did. They did. <clears throat> so our industrial adoption of 3D printing, and I know that everyone's real familiar with 3D printers. Uh, one of the reasons we, they use the word additive manufacturing is because they're becoming bigger. They're becoming more robust. Uh, most recently, uh, General Motors purchased 20 of our largest printer, the Fortis 900, to put in their production facilities all over the country from Wisconsin to Detroit to Arlington, Texas, where they make all the Suburbans. And we're using these parts in production live. I was very fortunate enough, I saw that we had two electric vehicle guys or ladies here today, right? Uh, has anybody heard of the Rivian, the new, uh, it's an SUV hybrid uh, pickup truck that's all electric? I was fortunate enough to visit Rivium, where they're actually using our H350 powder technology to actually make onboard parts for almost all their electrical connections. So they don't farm that out to anybody else. They make it all in-house. And they actually install it right on the vehicle and out the, out the door it goes. Before we move on to robotics competitions, another, another uh, example of adoption is NAV Air, which is our big uh, Navy air operations for the United States uh, Navy. They took on the same exact printers, the Fortis 900s, and they are going to be using 25 of those across their entire MRO network to print in our fireproof aviation plastics, either Antero or Ultim, Ultim 9085, Ultim 1010. And that, all these planes that fly, they have to have flame, smoke, and toxicity rated plastics on board. They can't have regular stuff that we use in these chairs or at home. And those printers with nav air are now printing onboard parts for almost all of our military aircraft and flying. 
Uh, we are also heavily involved in the robotics competitions, as you can imagine. I was lucky enough to be a judge for Skills USA this past uh, summer or spring in Atlanta. It was a lot of fun. And uh, this year's competition for FIRST Robotics, is anybody involved with FIRST? No? Okay. FIRST Robotics down in Houston, they had there, and Scott Crump actually took my place because I was on vacation, and he went down and judged for us for the FIRST Robotics in Houston this past spring. As far as design, I remember you said you're in design back there. Uh, our ability to handle design for pre-production or the invention process when you're making a new product, that's when Polyjet can come in. You can do simulation of basically wood, metal, plastic. You can do simulation of organic materials like grass, mat, straw. You can print anything that's actually real and simulate it to make products in their pre-production uh, pre design phase. Who is a fan of uh, the movies out of the Leica Studios? Anybody like Kubo and the Two Strings or Coraline or those movies that are all the animatronics? All right, so Leica Studios, they use our Polyjet technology on our big J platforms, and they actually print, I don't know if you guys can see it, every single face, every single wink, every single smile, every nod to make their motion capture animatronics for those movies. And they're exclusively made on Stratasys printers. They run a bank of 14 of them and that's actually how they make every single set piece, every single character for their movies. Uh, and they're, they're, they're not the only ones. So there's others that do it as well. In biochemistry, I talked a little about earlier how we can do air gaps and we can do uh, uh, simulated bone and organs. Uh, Georgia Tech and the researchers are developing really revolutionary 3D printed micro, microfluidic devices. And they're using that on the Polyjet technology as well. They're using them actually to trap cancer cells. And that's the whole goal is to trap and surround the cancer cells so they can't feed and grow. All right, for our additive manufacturing certification program, really what it's doing is, is bridging the gap for workforce development and bringing together industry and our educators, hopefully through the students to get them certified, to get them onto the next phase of their careers as they graduate and leave you guys. So the lack of industry uh, endorsed proof that the workforce has the AM skills it was a need for this and what we're trying to solve. Uh, there was inconsistent development over skills. Some programs had a lot of skills involved, some had very little. They were just able to actually make a print and move on, but not actually do processing and other things you need to do to be successful in your creation. Uh, interest from our customers, from our community colleges and our tech schools, as well as our academic programs. Uh, the idea is to access for schools for over $2 billion out there in economic development workforce funding from our government, our training, and our prep courses. And lastly, it's the ability to showcase our job-related skills to attain the actual certifications for the students and get them that certification onto their degree and onto their resume to go forward. So our targeted uh, certification personas are full-time students at vocational techs, either two-year or four-year programs, any post-secondary schools, advanced high schools in tech, and we have some very advanced ones. Uh, I even have a middle school uh, that's part of the NASA Hunch program that uses a Stratus 4-450 uh, using exclusively Altem uh, in a middle school for design for NASA projects where they've actually flown projects on the space station. Warren Tech out in uh, Greeley, Colorado also does, uh, they've also put as well. Uh, and the other uh, personas that we're targeting are non-traditional degreed students that are working for a certificate to advance their own career so they can actually go in and sit and take a test and hopefully increase their marketability and skill set to the work uh, for our employers out there. All right, so in, to do this we actually built a consortium of schools. Uh, we use Dunwoody College of Technology, we use South Central Community College, uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology, UC Irvine, and Iowa State round out our consortium. And these were the people that helped us develop the program and also develop the testing and have helped us uh, 
to proctor the first tests in the exams that we've just come out with this past year. So it comes in levels, and for this first certification that we've launched with Nocti, it's going to be exclusively in the FDM space. It is our most popular space. It uh, compromises about 70% of Stratasys' business. Uh, we're most known for, I think, FDM overall of all the technologies. Uh, number two would probably be PolyJet. So in this course, what you're going to be trained on and taught if you take this course or if you're a student uh, in the content that's enabled, it's basically got eight modules to it. We start with AM technology and the history of FDM. We move into the, all the industry applications uh, that use FDM. We then talk about the actual printer technology and the specifications. We talk about all the materials properties and the best practices. We go through design and fabrication collaboration and we get into our Stratasys Grab, GrabCAD software and all of our advanced FDM training for designing to get to the right parts for FDM. Uh, we also have a, a system called Insight. It is the actual G-code enabler that trains the robotic heads, how to make the toolpath turns and how to actually lay down the material. That Insight software is also trained in this program. And the actual last part of the program is the post-processing. So if you have an additive machine, you know that to bridge certain geometries, you have to use support material. And that support material has to be removed successfully. Uh, we're getting more and more advanced at it. Stratasys developed almost 20 years ago a wash-away support material that used basically uh, dishwashing detergent to wash away the support material. Now we've become, we've gotten to the point where we can actually wash it away with just plain tap water. Uh, the requirements for the institution, for any institution, any tech program is you have to have at least one of our Stratasys FDM 123 printers, which is what this gentleman has. Uh, they are our least expensive printers. They're designed for education. They're very affordable. But you have to have that at least in the program or a 450. And I believe that Tulsa Tech has two 450s at two different campuses. Uh, the instructor has to be prepared and engaged to use and teach the technology. In order to do that, uh, they've got to pay for their time and their basically their lodging to come up to Stratasys and we will train you for free in a four-day course that will be attended in person in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, which is at our headquarters where we make all the printers. Uh, it actually is a wonderful tour to come up to if you do it. Uh, and they have to pass the certification exam before they teach the students. Uh, the students, there are fees involved. We're hoping to keep the fees to take the test to be right around $30. Back when Stratasys did it ourselves, we charged $99. That was kind of to cover our costs as a business but we did want to make it very affordable for students to take this exam and get the certification. And we settled with Nocti and came up with a little bit of extra money out of some of our budgets. And we've got it right around $30 per certification per student. Uh, they will have to actually have a copy of GrabCAD print, which is actually free to anyone. Uh, they will have to have the experience with at least SolidWorks or any other parametric based 3D product like AutoCAD or Inventor or Katia, Pro-E, all examples that you guys may have heard of in the past. Uh, they've got to sit for the exam, of course, and they uh, then pick up their Nocti endorsement when they're done. I'm sorry, say again for me. Well, the, the, the instructor could certainly administer the exam, but there will be a completely online version available, uh, and they will be taking that test uh, through Nocti and their website. All right, I think the rest of the slides are really, honestly, a deeper dive into the, each module. And I'm not going to get into that, because I don't think that that's, unless you guys want to hear about it, uh, it gets a little dry. But I think overall, the, 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 the thing I want to leave you with it is this kind of uh, certification has been done in other spaces in our industry. I know that FANUC, that robotic over there, they do this certification through Nocti as well. Uh, Amitrol does it as well, another, another great electronic and manufacturing vendor that makes machine tools. Um, this is our first opportunity to offer this for students, and we're pretty excited about it. 
Um, not in the history of the, the market of 3D printing has this ever been offered before, and we're excited to offer it to students. We are going through a big change at Stratasys. I think that anybody who runs one of our printers will tell you, we have been, since we started the business 30 years ago, we've been a closed source company. So if you buy a Stratasys machine, you can't just go to Exxon or Shell or anywhere else to get your material, right? You can't go to your car and get your gas. You had to buy our materials. And that's led us to be one of the most expensive options out there. Now we do give educators a 50% discount on all of our materials, but that uh, was good enough for a while, but isn't really good enough anymore. Uh, this year, Stratus is announcing that we are opening up all of our platforms and we are opening up all of our machines to third parties. We are creating a specialized software suite where you could purchase your materials from any vendor that makes them that you choose. It could be 3M, it could be Inconel, it could be uh, Covestra or Loctite or any one of the major plastics manufacturers out there that makes these things, and they all do. And you'll be able to use that software to tweak and dial. Uh, what that means specifically just for Tulsa Tech is y'all been running 450s now for, Jamie? How long have they had their 450s? Five years longer? Uh, one was uh, recently put in um, maybe last year, and then the other system, the other 450 was probably here uh, six years. Yeah, so I knew it had been at least five years. You're limited, to, you're limited to what is actually the largest amount of materials on the market with that 450. Y'all have 13 materials to choose from. When we announced the Open AM, that the other manufacturers jumped in and they provided 14 more. So you guys now have 27 different materials that you would have access to. And we're talking about PC Kevlar, stuff that's bulletproof. We're talking about ABS carbon fiber 10 and nylon 12 carbon fiber, as well as a whole host of new aerospace uh, materials. Just as, as far, that machine and others like it print uh, plastic, Antero and Altem parts that fly on the UL rockets and on the SpaceX rockets. They are putting these uh, 3D printed parts on board almost the entire aircraft now and using it to make aircraft and other, everything from the automobile business to the veterinary sciences. It's all there and available. So I hope that that inspires you guys to learn more about Stratasys and I hope it inspires you to come up to Minnesota and get trained for all you educators that teach these programs. We would love to host you. Uh, we do make the course available free for you and take that back to your students and spread the word for additive manufacturing. Any questions? No? So the training, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is for, for, to teach that certification course? And yes. The certification is actually an online exam. Absolutely. So, so the, 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 the training in Minnesota is for the educator, for the teacher, for the professor to come and learn the entire system. Um, it's, it's very in-depth. It's four days. It's, uh, it's a lot. The course that's actually being delivered is about 40 credit hours worth that they're going to take back to the students. They can teach it throughout the entire semester as part of a design course. They can teach it as an individual course in and of itself. Uh, and then the students can then take the class online or the teacher can administer the test in her class, in their class. Okay. And then a curriculum is all provided to the Yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute 40-hour credit course in a box. Mike, did you talk about some of the applications for, for additive 3D printing? I talked a little bit about some medical, talked a little bit about some aviation and some auto. Uh, got anything we could talk yeah, about more? I'm just curious. I would like Mike to introduce some ideas around additive manufacturing. I mentioned prototyping is typically what you would think, but there are in-use parts as well. Yeah. And there are fixtures. What are fixtures? Well, fixtures are, let's say, I own the company that manufactures all the chairs we're sitting in, right? And I've got a little assembly line going to make these chairs. Fixtures are what we inserted the seat backs and the seat things. Holding tools, fixturing is all part of manufacturing. Whenever uh, an individual worker is working on an assembly line or they're working at a station, it's something that will hold the work they're working on in place securely so they can use both their hands to do their job. Uh, last year, in January, a year ago, uh, my mother turned 80 and she had always wanted to visit Key West. And I promised her I would take her. So we 
flew to Miami and we rented a Ford Mustang and we drove the highway down to Key West, which is something that everyone should do once in their lifetime. Uh, that Ford Mustang, for years, on the production line at Ford, it has a little, it has only two side windows and a little triangle piece of glass window in the very back, right? Whether it's a convertible or a, a, a fixed roof. For years, Ford used 8020 stock aluminum, which is a, it's like a Lego for, in, for industry, to make a holding fixture to grab that window and to move it for the assembly worker to put it into the car like this. This was the operation. And it was not comfortable. And if the worker were to brush wrong against that beautiful red paint with that 8020 aluminum, it would just scuff the living daylights out of that paint. Stratasys went in, we talked about some holding fixtures tools. We used a soft Duran plastic, which is non-marring, to make a new ergonomically centered around human hands, you know, that fit a person's body. Uh, to change that tool, and now that assembly line literally saves, I think it was $880,000 of new refresh paint touch-ups that Ford had to do as workers would scuff the cars down the assembly line. So that's a lot for a manufacturer to save for just a simple design change of way we used to do it to a new additive technique of today. And it just expands from there as far as applications go. The applications are almost endless when it comes to design, manufacturing, and even in medical. I'm going to be uh, not as long-winded as these guys. I, I want to get some hands-on over here. I know people probably want to stretch their legs too, but I uh, just want to talk a little bit about Creaform and what I do with our products and how it ties into what you've already uh, listened to today. Uh, and a lot of what everyone has mentioned without saying it directly is that we're, we're trying to move uh, forward with technology to eliminate monotonous tasks, to eliminate repetitive tasks, and to speed up things and improve efficiencies. And so that's exactly where 3D scanning comes into play across really any industry, uh, from a digital twin environment in VR, to uh, we've talked about medical for making orthopedics for, for people, uh, to quality, to reverse engineering across all industries. So here in Oklahoma, there's primarily oil and gas, uh, uh, farming, aerospace, that sort of thing. So all of these different industries need and can use, whether it's quality instruments or reverse engineering, updating uh, old drawings and creating models and virtual twins. Um, talking about even with um, 3D printing is we can easily create a model and then test the model to see if it's going to work, compare it to a CAD, things like that, before we even print the first one. So right now, a lot of people will design it, print it, test it, redesign it, reprint it, and see if it works. Well, in a digital environment, we can do all I'll start a little bit on the quality side, which is, you know, everyone's familiar with tape measures, right? So if I asked anyone here to go measure from end to end in a chair with the tape measure, and I asked the person next to them to do it, they're not gonna get the exact same measurement. I could almost guarantee it. But that's the way the industry's done things for a long time. Even uh, a caliper has a certain level of training that someone needs to do, and you have to tell them exactly where to position it in order to get an accurate measurement, which is great. We've done it for a long time. It's highly accurate. But in scanning, I can let anybody here go scan any part in the room and then take measurements from that, have anyone else go scan the exact same part, and they're going to be exactly the same. So what have we done there? We've eliminated a lot of monotonous tasks and we've eliminated need for, for training and the data that we're collecting is far more accurate than what we've been living with in the past, right? The other thing is portability. So on the scanning side of things, there are really high quality, high um, accuracy instruments that have been used for years, whether it's coordinate measuring machines or probing tips, things of that nature, but they're not portable. You can't take them into a classroom, right? You have to take everyone to them. With scanning, we can take in a briefcase to any classroom, any industry, and within minutes set up and be able to take data, whether it's for, again, reverse engineering or quality inspection. And uh, as far as industry is concerned, it doesn't matter. Right? We can scan anything but clear glass. So 
uh, from that standpoint, it's just going to be, it's going to improve efficiencies. It's going to tie even students to industry a lot quicker. We can, you don't have to have as extensive training on the hardware. It's going to be software related. On the software side of things, uh, at least with Creaform, we're agnostic. So once you create your 3D scan, any other software that you're utilizing is going to be able to take that in, which is very important, right? You're not going to be siloed into one specific thing. So that's, uh, I think, a really good reason to explore new technologies. Um, I've mentioned kind of industries. I know that, that Jamie had alluded to a, a few manufacturers in the area. Uh, there are people that are, that are moving in the general direction, but what I've spoken with Brian about just a few minutes ago is that there is a kind of a lack of, of resources in technology for programming robots, programming machine vision systems, working with 3D scanners. So industry is gonna be a lot more apt to apply these technologies as we create a more educated workforce in order to use them, which thankfully Tech Labs is, is stepping in and kind of helping everyone out and going in that direction. Um, so I've, I've made it quick and easy, but I, I really would like to get uh, some hands on with everything, let people stretch their legs. If anyone has questions uh, related to 3D scanning, um, or Jamie, if I've just completely glossed over something that you want me to touch on, uh, let me know. I've got uh, two different models over here. Well, te technically Tech Labs has one. Um, and there are two different versions of the technology that in, in essence are gonna collect uh, same data, mesh data. One is a structured light system. So it's gonna use white structured light. Then cameras are gonna look at the way that that light is reflected off of the part to create geometric surfaces, color, and texture. Uh, another one is uh, similar but different. It's gonna use laser crosshairs. So it's not gonna scan in color, but it's gonna scan much more accurately. And uh, Jamie had alluded to it before, but we're scanning really tight accuracies. And by that, I mean nine tenths of a thou. So when we're talking about aerospace or medical or things with really high tolerances, that's how we're able to achieve it is with the lasers. So, and they both have their, their position in the marketplace, but the end result is a uh, mesh that you can put measurements to, you can create models, you can make a watertight mesh of a part and then print it with a printer. So the use cases for the technology are, are really endless.